Hi, everybody, and welcome to the webinar, Google My Business Masterclass. My name is Steve, your host for today, and I'm joined by Nick Kaunov Olive, a Senior Digital Marketing Success Manager here at Surefire Local. So two quick housekeeping items. In case you're unfamiliar with who Surefire Local is, our mission is to help you make online marketing easy by providing your business with a next generation platform that's available everywhere you need it across devices and browsers. We provide you the software you need to attract customers and grow profits efficiently, all from one place. And yes, this webinar will be recorded. You will receive an email later this afternoon with a link to view both the replay and a PDF of the presentation. So feel free to sit back, listen, and take it all in while you're here. And you can also engage with us at any time using the questions tab, which you should see in the GoToWebinar control panel on your screen. You can also share any feedback by emailing marketing at surefirelocal.com. Nick has a great presentation for you today, full of secrets and tips that can help you unlock your local reach and improve your chances of getting found on Google. Nick will walk you through it, understanding why Google My Business is so critical to your digital footprint, and then also share how to actually use your Google My Business listing to improve your visibility. So with that, I'm gonna pass things over to you, Nick. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good morning. It is a pleasure to meet with everyone, or at least present to everyone today. Uh, so today's gonna be a really fun uh, exercise as we go through talking about Google My Business. I'm sure a majority of you have at least interacted with a Google My Business page. Whether or not you've established yours and claimed yours, it's a whole nother story. But today I'm gonna be presenting to you two main components. One, just some general statistics about some elements of consumer behavior, how that behavior is interacting with Google and how Google itself is actually helping position companies to be more successful. And then the second is I'm gonna walk through kind of the, the technical, the mechanics behind how do you get your Google My Business page configured and why you do certain things in there. So the first part that we're gonna go over today is just the general trends. And one thing that I want to emphasize to you immediately right now, Google is making a serious and fundamental shift towards hyper-locality. Even if the search result results in a national chain or national brand or something to that effect, at least Google is attempting to serve up the most local result possible when relevant. And so something that we wanna kind of like put out there and emphasize is the fact that the mobile experience is dominating. Um, overwhelming majority of browsing on Google and on the internet is now happening on a mobile device rather than a old school desktop or a laptop. This changes elements of consumer behavior. And one of the ways that that is happening is people are spending more time browsing around and being willing to find, to, to discover what they're searching for. Google's gotten smart and it understands how to present certain things, but sometimes people just don't know what they don't know when they're attempting to search for stuff. And this is where elements of discovery come into play. And having a strong online presence helps get your name out there and capture the attention of everyone. If you think about how distracted we are in our lives, being able to capture the attention of those whose services you could potentially provide to is imperative. So talked about a little bit of the, the, the changing landscape of consumer behavior. Let's kind of hit on these for a minute here. We've already touched on the fact that mobile is the dominating force. Um, I need to introduce you to this concept of zero click searches. Now this could be a webinar on its own, but in short, back in 2019, 50.33% of all Google searches resulted in what's called a zero click action or zero click search, where they may have seen the phone number for something or went to a different place but didn't click on your brand or didn't click on your website when it was served up as Google saying, hey, this is the most relevant result. This happens to do with the fact that most people are using their mobile devices and would rather browse something visual 
through video or photos. So aside from the main search engine results page, when you search for something on Google, the second most popular place that people go, believe it or not, is actually the images section within Google. And Google, and you're gonna notice this is a theme as I go through this, Google is attempting to serve up local images and local videos and local results, even in those other subsections of its digital property when possible. The other contributing factor to some of this here is voice search. This has become really dominant in the last couple of years, and it's presented a very technical challenge to Google and the others. So when you say, hey Siri, hey Alexa, hey Google, et cetera, you are utilizing that form of search in a very different way than what you're utilizing it from a mobile device to actually punching it in with your fingers or uh, even on a keyboard for a computer. The big difference here is there's more words included in the search. Um, it is causing it to be more conversational. So traditional search is manipulated and changed now through the fact that we are using our voices to search, which consequently has produced a weird element where Google on average is seeing about 15% of all searches on a daily basis being unique to them, as in they've never seen that type of search results before or that, that search in that combination of words before. So all that is kind of setting up for what we're doing today to help you ensure that you dominate. And so one of the key things that I do have to point out with respect to hyperlocal marketing, and this is something that Google is working on, is the idea of having a physical address versus just a general service area. Now, for those of you who are small business owners and work out of your home, I think the most obvious reason why you don't wanna necessarily publish your location is because of potentially either solicitors or bad or angry customers or something like that. You don't want people trying to you know, bug you at your home. So there is this level of protection and Google understands why that's a thing. So one of the things that we need to make sure that you do when you set up your Google My Business profile and one of the things that you do when you are continuing to manage your online presence is keeping the, the idea out there of identifying your geolocation. Where are you at? Where are you posting these images from? Where was this picture taken? Things along those lines. So there are basically kind of three main key factors that go into um, your, your local ranking search factors. Uh, relevance, distance, and, per, and, and prominence. Relevance being does this is, well, it's quite frankly, defining itself. Is it relevant to the search that I'm looking for and the results that are showing up? Distance. If I'm in Washington, D.C., I don't necessarily want uh, results for somewhere in Boston. I want somewhere closer. And then prominence has to do basically with the idea of, you know, how authoritative is your website? How long has it been around? Does it have the information that I'm going to need? And so let's take a quick step back in the history of search and talk about the evolution of what's occurred here. So back in the day, you used to be able to do something called keyword stuffing on your website. Back of the website, you throw up a bunch of keywords and hope that somehow people found you. This resulted fairly quickly in a bad user experience. So think about if you were to pull out your phone right now and search pizza. Google already knows where you're located, so it's gonna serve up to you, let's expect maybe three or four different types of results. Restaurants immediately around you that serve pizza, recipes for pizza, maybe a Wikipedia page or something like that, and then some local news articles. If I'm in Washington, DC, and I search for pizza, and I get a bulk cheese manufacturer from Wisconsin that sells 50 pound blocks of mozzarella as part of the first page search results when I'm simply searching pizza, that is a bad user experience. And that is an example of old school uh, keyword trafficking, no, I'm sorry, keyword stuffing. Now in November of 2019, Google made a fundamental shift on how it's serving up local search results. And this has been permeated out and has continued on. Distance or proximity used to be the main driving factor for 
how something in a local result would show up. And that makes sense from a rudimentary standpoint on why Google would do that. However, that isn't necessarily the greatest way to serve up the search results. And so now Google has shifted to having relevancy be the more domineering reason behind why one company will show up versus another. Think about how there are certain terms that can be applied in very different ways. If you search for window replacement, are you searching for auto window replacement or home or business window replacement? So depending upon the words that are used in there, Google's attempting to parse down to provide those who are searching with the most relevant content possible. There's other elements that go into this. Um, recency being one that I will touch on in a little bit here, but there's an element of consumer behavior that ties into recency, and I'll discuss that in a moment. Um, so what is Google My Business? Great question. It basically is your second website. It is a free piece of software on Google that effectively allows you to put your name out there, um, show attributes about who your company is, how to get in contact with you, what you do, what you sell, photos, etc. Google being Google want to keep you on their digital property. So it behooves them to have some form of digital presence for you on their digital property. So let's walk through these. Um, this is kind of like the areas that exist for your Google My Business page. You have basic information about your company, uh, reviews, the products and services that you offer. Shoot, people can even book an appointment through you, which is pretty fantastic. Um, you have encountered Google My Business in probably three different capacities. Starting on the left is the knowledge panel. Now that'll happen when we search primarily something specific. If I'm searching for you know, a company called, I don't know, Anderson Roofing, I would expect Anderson Roofing in my service area to pop up and have this thing pop up on the right-hand side of the screen. If you scroll down the page a little bit, you're gonna get something called the map pack. That's gonna be generally served up with something more of a generic search, like roofer near me or roofer Washington DC. And then if you toggle over to Google Maps, you have a whole list of companies that will show up and you can click on each individual one and it populates the Google My Business profile there. It's all pulling from the same data source. It's just being served up with a different user interface depending upon what you're looking at. Now, I did indicate that I would go over this element of recency. And one thing that I really want to talk about with you here is human behavior is very funny. Uh, we'll touch on this a little bit later, but if you have posts on your Google My Business page or photos that you have not updated since 2013, there's a general level of, of confidence that is lowered based off consumer behavior. It sounds bizarre. If you're a dentist, that's what you do is dentistry. Not much maybe has changed in the way of the photos that you're going to take, but people are going to want to see more recent photos. Um, that's that. So in order for you to dominate your local service area, one thing that you're going to notice out of this presentation is it's going to take some work, OK? Um, you have to upload photos. You have to create posts like you would on Facebook or Twitter. You've got to constantly make sure that your service area is up to date, that the products and services that you're offering are up to date, that any specials you're offering are up to date, things like that. Um, this is the modern world at this point now with respect to how you have to manage your online presence. Um, here at Surefire, we also have a piece of software that helps you do that. I'll drop that in right now and I'll move on. <laughs> um, so that's part one, kind of setting up everything. So let's talk about how you can actually step through and get this whole thing set up for yourself. A while back, Google was just creating Google My Business Pages. They've now shifted it upon the business owner, and it is your responsibility to create and or claim your Google My Business listing. Um, it's a very straightforward process, and I'll walk you through that in a minute. 
The other things that you're going to have to populate in here, for the most part, it's going to be a set it and forget it unless you start expanding services. Uh, but you're going to punch in your business info, where you do business, um, how people can get a hold of you, and the products and services you offer. So even though you guys are going to be getting a copy of this, let's walk through this pretty quickly. First and foremost, you need to have a Gmail address. If you do not have a Gmail address, go ahead and create one. This way you can create your Google My Business listing. Um, very straightforward. You punch in all your information, and then Google goes ahead and sends out a verification to you. In my experience, most of my customers receive a verification through uh, the mail. Google will send you a piece of paper with like a six digit code on it that you're gonna punch in and it verifies that you are who you say you are. Now, we are aware of the fact that at some point, Google is going to be offering, I guess what I'm calling enhanced Google My Business profiles where you're gonna be able to pay uh, to have some levels of enhancement to your Google My Business profile. We haven't gotten much information about that, but we know that it's coming. And so I figured right now would be a good time to talk about that. Um, so keep your eye, your, your, your ears open, your eyes open to hearing what is coming out of that. For those of you who receive our um, communications, keep, keep a look at, out for that. Once we have more information, we will be sharing that with you. Um, moving on. This part in our research, I found to be absolutely shocking. Um, the number is quite astounding to me that over half of businesses have not taken the time to claim their local business listing. Or if they have it, they may have set it up once back in 2013 and haven't done anything with it. You've got to put yourself in the consumer's shoes and realize how frustrating that is. Because for a lot of companies, it's a lot easier for me as a consumer to search for something and find the results immediately on the Google results page, rather than having to go into someone's website, verify my location, punch in a zip code, et cetera, et cetera, to only understand what your hours of operation are. Uh, that is one specific example, but it showcases the fact that there's still a ton of opportunity for those of you who have not claimed yours to start dominating your local market because there's a possibility that one of your competitors down the street has not taken the time to claim, sorry, claim their Google My Business page. So adding your information here, very straightforward as well. One really cool thing is you can set up a virtual tour of your office. You can take pictures um, and set them up. Really hugely popular with my eye care center, um, and in fact, just I'd say just in general, our medical-based uh, customers. Uh, people really like to understand the building that they're about to walk into, who they're going to meet, et cetera. Going back to the idea here that people would rather utilize Google My Business over jumping to a website is clearly displayed here. The yearning for people to get information as fast as possible, this number is gonna to continue to go up as time goes on. Um, in my personal opinion, Google could be doing a little bit better job advertising that Google My Business is a thing for the consumers. That said, consumers are naturally learning that most Google My Business pages, the information is accurate, and they want to be able to interact with that. Okay, so I've set up a little bit about why you should be doing this. Let me reinforce it with a little bit further here. This is extremely important for you to help dominate your local market. Should you have a well-functioning Google My Business page that has all the appropriate things filled out, you will see up to a 56% jump in website visits and a 24% jump in calls to your business. Simply by taking, I'm gonna say, less than an hour of your time to make sure that your Google My Business page is set up. That other part here, asking for directions. Um, 
that's really for two reasons. One, people may just physically want to know where you're at so they can visit your location. But also, it's a form of trust but verify. People want to see that you are actually located where you say you are as opposed to being you know, concerned. They want to click and say, where are you? Okay, I see you're on the map there. Great. These are pretty big. Um, the amount of additional business that you can garner from having a well-configured Google My Business page, this thing pays off for itself in spades. Now, your service area. This is a big one. Back in the day, Google didn't really care about how many um, locations that you set up as your service area. They wanted you to be granular. It got a little too confusing and they narrowed it down and now it's been narrowed down again to 20 areas. So the best practices that we recommend is starting off on the so you can cast the widest net possible and then narrow down by either city, town, um, or a zip code itself, but you're only limited to 20. So, so that's that. <laughs> All right, um, moving on. Categories. This is a very interesting one here. These are meant to describe who you are as an organization. I am a dentist. I am an HVAC installer, things like that. What you cannot put in here and what Google will punish you for is if you attempt to embellish under the category section. There is an open text field where you can describe your company. So you can put dentist if you want to. What Google does not want you to put is like the most affordable dentist in town or the coolest, <laughs> the coolest AC guy around, right? They don't want that. Um, that is not a way that people are going to actually search. And so Google wants to match based off categories. Because remember, Google's gotten smart. It understands synonyms. It understands if I'm searching for roofer, roofing, shingle repair, et cetera, I'm looking for something that falls under the umbrella of like roofing contractor, for example. Straightforward enough. The other element that you can get to add in here is products and services. This is where you can get a lot more granular with describing what it is that you install. So I'm gonna keep using roofing for a while, but if you're a roofer, you can specify that you install GAF. If you do siding, you can specify that you install Hardy. If you're a window, uh, if you're a window company, you can say that we install Provia windows and doors or whatever. The point here is to narrow it because there's gonna be that population of uh, educated consumers that are going to search off name brand and local installer before they search for anything else. They know what they want. They know they want this particular brand because of the color scheme or whatever, and then go from there. The appointment link, this is great, but best practices here. You need to lead this to a web capture form somewhere on your website that also has a phone number. Most websites are configured appropriately enough where the uh, contact us section or book an appointment with us section or whatever on the website is sufficient. So you're gonna go ahead and drop that link in to the appointment section there. If you do not have an appointment section or something that's very clearly labeled as here's how to get a hold of us, Go ahead and get that fixed on your website as soon as humanly possible. This is a big one because you will lose out on people um, contacting you because again, keep in mind, people don't necessarily want to browse a website. However, if you direct them directly to, here's how to get a hold of us, that will help with people uh, clicking through. Now, attributes are a brand new thing to Google. Um, they're going to be constantly adding them over time but this allows you to identify based off certain things that people find to be important. So if you are a veteran-led organization, uh, some people pre prefer to do business with vets, being able to highlight that might be just one of those extra little things that, that convinces someone to pick up the phone and call you versus your competition. Now, uh, here's where the bulk of the work is gonna come into play on an ongoing basis. Reviews, posts, photos and videos, and Q&A. 
I'm going to walk you through all four of these categories here. Reviews. These serve a couple purposes. From the technical perspective, the more reviews that you have, that means the more prominent you're growing online, that means Google has a level of trust factor on you, okay? In general, with the public as well, the more reviews that you have, preferably good ones, uh, the more likely someone is to do business with you. What's really interesting here is responses to the reviews themselves bear no weight on your search engine optimization, your SEO, or your local ranking factors, or anything like that. Your responses are for the general public. Everyone wants to feel acknowledged. If I took the time to go online and respond back to you, or to, 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 to write a post on your Google My Business page about how great something is that you did for me, you should be thanking me for doing that. You should be thanking every customer that leaves a review. Now, what about the negative reviews, Nick? Great question. Negative reviews do not carry the same death sentence that they used to. Negative reviews are an opportunity to show who you are as a company and show the character of your company. People are going to be leaving negative reviews no matter what. If you haven't gotten one, I promise you, you will get one. How you respond to it is the issue here. Do not type in all capital letters, which is the equivalent of yelling on the internet. Uh, don't threaten a lawsuit, et cetera, et cetera. If you or a teammate or a subordinate or someone screwed up, take ownership of it. Yes, we screwed up. We're sorry we arrived late. We're sorry we ordered the wrong color. Here's my personal email address. Let me fix it. How can I help you? Um, this is extremely important to go through because I will do business with a company that has a three or even two star rating as long as I see that the owner has either taken action to rectify the situation or to turn the whole thing around or something to that effect. So be conscientious about how you respond back to negative reviews. Because if you're not kind in how you respond back in a negative review, I as a consumer look back and go, okay, what's the negotiation process gonna look like? If something gets messed up along the way, how easy is it for us to find a middle ground to rectify the situation? And if you're yelling at people online, I'm gonna look at that and go, huh, I'm not gonna hire you to do this because Murphy's Law, something's gonna go wrong and you're gonna be a jerk about it and I don't wanna deal with that. So something to really think about on, on how you handle that. Now, that said, only a Gmail account can leave a Google My Business review. The likelihood of someone taking the time to create a Gmail account just to leave you a review is pretty slim. I'm sure it happens, but I, I, I don't foresee a lot of people doing that. So the next best two places to ask for reviews would be a direct review on your website, should you have something like that enabled, or send people to Facebook. Because Facebook, let's be honest, really is the next word of mouth, um, or at least the digital version of the common word of mouth. So being able to post on there, most people will have a Facebook page, great, direct them that direction. The other cool thing here is for those of you who have customers that are, um, you know, that are capable of leaving a review for you, you can create your own little personal link right here and then put that in the body of every email. So for my home services based companies, perhaps you send out a final invoice or a two week check-in or something like that. And you say, hey, listen, here's a copy of our link. Would you go ahead and leave a review? Now, that said, if you tell someone that you're going to send them a link within the next two minutes for them to leave a review, knowing that they're in front of a computer, they are having a higher likely chance of leaving a review right there and then than in the future. So a best practice that I coach my customers on is get someone on the phone and tell them that you're going to send them a review, thank them for their business, and then move on. All right, this is huge. Again, going back to the idea of the how you respond to the reviews and the frequency in which you've gotten reviews, make a really big decision for make make a really big 
impact on how someone makes a decision on whether or not to call you, make a purchasing decision, something to that effect. And this notion of frequency um, or, or, or recency is really important here. There's something about us where anything over two to three weeks, we start to have doubt in our head. Is this company still around? Are they still um, open for business? Ooh, their last re review was five weeks ago. Why has it been so long for, since a review? Same thing kind of applies to the content component of posting, but um, it's something that I want you to be conscientious of. So you should have a goal to attempt to receive several reviews on a weekly basis. Now, I know this doesn't necessarily apply to everyone. I'm sure there's some folks on the phone here that are like what I would regard as like a boutique home builder and only build six homes a year. Okay, you're likely not going to be able to get four reviews a month. I get that. But generally speaking, you should be aiming for every positive experience with the customer, inquiring with them to, add, to leave a review for you. Um, going back to the idea that I want to feel special and loved, I have a higher likelihood of doing business with you again if you take the very simple time to respond back to my review. Even if I left you a positive review, right? Um, you just being like, hey, Nick, thanks for your business. Uh, your dog running around the yard was a great site foreman, ha, ha, ha. Make it personal, make it fun. And that that reinforces that you care about the fact that I spent thousands of dollars with you. Um, it's a really big thing. It's a positive reinforcement for folks. Just do it. Now, going back to the idea of negative reviews, we are pretty good about coaching our customers on how to deal with negative reviews. But one thing that I want to emphasize here, and the numbers don't lie, is you've got about a one-third chance of getting that negative review either revised or completely deleted. And when you're able to remove the emotion, step back and go, okay, did we have a screw up or is the customer being unreasonable? If the customer is being unreasonable, how do we call them out on that without us looking pompous, right? So there's that balance you got to strike there, which is why I, I, I keep going back to this, but I'm going to emphasize it again. Talk about it with someone. Talk about it if you're working with us, your digital marketing strategist. Talk with me. Let's figure out the proper response. If there is a genuine mess, you know, mess up, go for it. Figure out how to take ownership to what you had to say or, or to, to the, the situation that occurred. Okay. Um, little thing, no control really on your side here, but um, People are able to leave attributes uh, as part of their review to you, okay? This will help people um, understand who you are as a company because it's all good and fine to say this is a positive review and someone write up everything. But again, going back to this idea that we are quick needing to get basic pieces of information, if I can look and go, okay, they've got good value and they're punctual and they're professional, cool, I'll give them a call. Sometimes decisions are made just that quickly. So how do you get this? You can download the app or you can work from it from your computer. Um, the app is really easy uh, because it makes it very easy for you to upload photos and respond to reviews and whatever, whatever. Surefire Local also has an app. Moving on. <laughs> All right. Posting. This is so critical. So, so critical. Yes. You already have to post stuff to your website and Twitter and Facebook and I don't know, Pinterest and wherever else you're posting. And now you have to post to Google My Business. It is daunting. I get it. That said, it's super easy to do it. And there's basically two different types of posts that we're talking about here. Photos, which are standalone photos that go into a gallery built into your Google My Business page and then post themselves. Now, the posts themselves are, you can do a couple different things here. The most common three that are used are add update, add events, and then add offer. These are, the, the, the last two are pretty self-explanatory. You're gonna run a special, $500 off window installation, or buy one pair of 
prescription glasses get the second pair 50% off use this code you could set time parameters around when it runs how long it runs etc same thing goes with events if you are at a home show and you have a booth take a picture of the crew at the booth post it up post pictures from there add updates etc treat it like a twitter feed treat it like a facebook feed and then add update this is the most common post that pretty much everyone's going to do which you're going to treat again like social media. You are going to post a picture of something and describe it. Now, the really cool part about this also is it doesn't necessarily have to be specific to you. So for my roofers, let's just say GAF releases a brand new type of roofing shingle that lasts through 200 mile an hour winds and you're gonna start selling these. You may wanna put a press release up um, on there that links to the article that or the, the press release that the GAF released and then you'll have another link in there that takes you to the contact us section on your website call us and figure out if we can do this for you very simple uh, this applies to my dentists if there's some new I don't know uh, bonding material that helps make teeth 10 times stronger and you've been certified in the state to now do that guess what go for it post about it that is the cool stuff this these posts fall off after a couple of weeks so it's best practice to post a couple times a week through here again going back to the idea that we are visual creatures we are preferring to browse on our mobile devices you will see higher engagement with your brand online and you will see more likelihood of people clicking and coming to your website if you have photos up People want to see photos. Now, really interesting fact here, which I found to be so disappointing. Oh my gosh, most businesses only have 11 photos on their um, Google My Business page. You want way more than that. Take pictures of the crew having fun. Take pictures of the office staff doing something. You know, uh, take pictures of products and the services. Put these pictures up there because I want to know who you are as a company when I do business with you. Things are purposely getting a lot more personal, and I want to understand who are the technicians that are going to be coming out to my house. What does their truck look like? What does your office space look like? You have a huge selection of eyeglasses. Let, take a picture of that eyeglass wall selection. Oh, these are the top 10 selling eyeglass frames of the year? Show them to me. That's what I want to see. So make sure that you are constantly putting the content out there, knowing that people want to see these pictures, knowing that people are going to go to the images section. Now, a little bit of a kind of a photography 101, I'll just keep this brief. Be conscientious of the pictures that you post. Going back to my home improvement customers, um, I don't know your local county and state and whatever safety OSHA laws, be conscientious about posting anything that can be construed or outright is a OSHA violation. The last thing we want is a picture of someone on a five foot story, giant roof would not harnessed in and like, you know, God forbid someone get hurt and your Google My Business page suddenly becomes exhibit A in a lawsuit or number two, a board competitor or county inspector browsing your Google My Business page or even your website or something like that, you know, delighting in this treasure trove of violations that you have subsequently posted. Um, so be conscientious of that. Also, just think about the quality of the photo that you want to take. If it takes five extra minutes to clean up all the crap in the foreground, so this way you don't have a bunch of debris everywhere and it shows that you like work clean you're gonna wanna take that extra couple of minutes and clean up the pictures um, on what you're working on. Use the photos as an opportunity to be educational. Whatever photos you take here could also be part of a post. So, you know, uh, rotten roof decking is typically not covered by a, um, you know, an insurance claim for when someone's renewing their roof. So using that as an opportunity to take a picture of a rotten roof deck and go, hey, insurance doesn't cover this stuff. Always have a budget of a few hundred extra dollars in case we have to re replace a few pieces of uh, roof decking. That's an opportunity to educate and it's relevant. All right, moving on. Um, 
little things here at this point now, but you're going to want to uh, select a cover photo. So whether it be of like a banner of your building or the side of your newly stickered up truck or uh, the photo of the office staff or something like that, make it a nice looking cover photo. And then you're going to have to have a logo along with it. So make sure these are high quality images. All right, going back again to this idea of visual uh, stuff, you can create videos and post these onto your Google My Business page. You can post them on Facebook, you can post them on wherever else, but to talk about Google My Business today, that's what we're gonna talk about. But what I'm about to go over with you is universal to wherever you decide to post it. High production quality videos do not get the views that you think they might get. That's great that you spent $3,000 for someone to come out and take a drone shot of your storage yard and a couple of cool shots of you metal fabricating gutters and a few other things. But you know what? Your average consumer won't care. Go to YouTube right now and search for something. Search for something that you're doing as a home project. There will be video upon video of it. And the most popular videos are going to be the um, ones that are held with a cell phone camera and that are less than five minutes long and they cover a single subject. This is how to properly aerate and overseed your lawn. You can go to Home Depot and buy this aerator. Here's how much it costs. You could do this, this, and this and move on. The video is three minutes long and it's got like 5 million views. I'm not joking. There are videos like that out there. For my home improvement folks, and this does also apply to those who are not necessarily in home improvement, but there's an element of research that comes along with today's modern consumer. We all know that Google is the number one search engine in the world. What may come as a surprise to some of you is that the number two search engine in the world is actually YouTube. It's because people want to go to YouTube and quickly learn about something that they're gonna do. How to shop for a roofer, how to shop for a dentist. What is this surgery that my dentist is proposing to me? Why, what is an astigmatism? I need to see a video of why, why that matters. So you creating educational videos for your con prospective consumer base will drive traffic towards you, okay? Um, the more you can create, the more visibility, the more content, the more authority that you have online. All right, um, the last section I've got here has to do with questions and answers. Every Google My Business page is now enabled with a Q&A section. Anyone can ask any question about any subject and anyone can respond back in any way they see fit. So if you are an optometrist, I could go to your Google My Business page and post a ridiculous question. I could post, how much does it cost to install a swimming pool? And then someone else can come on and, and go, they took care of my guinea pigs really well as the answer. So you have the opportunity to drive the conversation about your brand in a local manner. So ask questions that are uh, of you. Um, you know, do you offer an, uh, insurance or do, do you do insurance jobs? Uh, do you offer financing? You know, what is the difference between uh, this or that? Any question that you can think of. What I like to tell my customers is any top 10-ish questions that you have to answer on a pretty regular basis when people call you, go ahead and post those online and then go ahead and answer them. The reason why I'm bringing this all full circle now at this point is see, you see this people all, uh, also ask section down at the bottom. A lot of Google searches will, at some point will also have this people also ask. The reason why that's there is because Google's attempting to understand how people are searching and finding relevant co uh, components that are along with it. But one thing that Google's trying to do is serve up hyper local results. So if you can populate your Q&A section with questions that are relevant to your brand or your business, over time, Google's intention is to populate the people also ask on a local level. Same thing with images and same thing with videos. Yes, 
popular questions will pop your, populate, popular images will populate, whatever. But Google's goal, going back to the beginning of this presentation, is hyper-locality. They want to present the most local result that is relevant possible to you. All right, last slide here. What, what I've got for you here. Um, I presented a lot to you. What is the takeaway here? Try if you can, set it as a goal for yourself. Five to 10 photos a week or videos, six to eight Google posts per week, depending upon your situation, at least a review a month, preferably three to five. And then just every couple of weeks, ask yourself a question and answer it. And that's it. The reason why we, uh, um, you know, we, we, we are successful and why my customer base is successful is not only following the guidelines that we've got, uh, but also our numbers speak for ourselves. So I'm not being a good salesperson at the end of the day here if I uh, talk about Surefire Local. As Stephen indicated at the beginning of our call, we have a brilliant piece of marketing software that allows our customers to dominate their local presence by having a single place to manage their digital footprint. Uh, you can post, you can review, you can write review, you can, you can respond back to reviews, you can create content. It's a single place to manage the multitude of uh, digital properties that Google is requiring you to manage today. Um, so I'm gonna turn this back over to Mr. Steven. And thank you everyone for your time. All right, thank you so much, Nick. Um, as you said, there's definitely a lot here to unpack and just kind of go through. Um, and you share a ton of great insights. So I just wanted to remind everybody that you will you will be getting this recording um, later this afternoon within a few hours. And you also have the option to click through the presentation. Um, and then also share that with anybody on your team that you think would benefit from this as well who isn't listening in. Um, so I would like to wrap up today by offering everybody here with us the chance just to learn more. Um, there's going to be a poll that appears on your screen and just learn more about Sharefire Local, the platform that Nick has mentioned, um, and how businesses like yours are using it to grow profit yeah, sorry, grow profitably and expand their digital footprint across all of Google. Um, so just let us know if you'd like to join us on a call or if you're a current customer already um, or if you're just not ready yet, you don't have the answer to. There's no pressure. Either way you answer, we're just glad you came to hang out with us for this hour. And if you are interested, we will reach out with you at, with uh, next steps after the webinar ends. All right, Nick, we did have one question for you, um, which is an interesting one. So Johnny is asking, one of the clients he works with has amazing reviews, but might have to change their business name. Is there a way to carry across the reviews and just change the name of their Google My Business account? Yes, yes, it's actually super easy and it's extremely common. It is, it is extremely common for customers of mine to either move locations or even change names. And all you do is make the changes within Google My Business. And depending upon the change, Google will probably require a verification. And so what you'll do then is you'll get something probably in the mail, that postcard. It's the most common way Google does it. Um, yeah, but like within a week, it's basically taken care of. So right, when you cool. make the changes in your Google My Business profile, it'll show something like um, changes pending, it'll be grayed out or something like that until you re-verify. Okay, bear with me for one second. We got a lot more questions coming in. Here is an, also an interesting one from uh, Laura. So she asks, how can we remove reviews we know are not real? Yeah, so that's a challenge. The 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 the, 
the answer I'll give you, you're probably not going to like, but it's get more reviews is, is really what it comes down to. I, I'd like to believe at this day and age, most consumers are smart enough to spot a bogus review. Um, and even if you put something simple in, in the response, like we don't know who you are, or we think you're reviewing the wrong business or something like that, that could be helpful enough. Just say, you know, and then provide your contact information. Now, if someone is like claiming something outlandish, there is a dispute process built into the help section within Google My Business. There's like a support section, but I wouldn't bank on many reviews being uh, eliminated. The, the best thing to do is just stack more reviews on top and move on, knowing that the general public looks at negative reviews with a grain of salt. All right, that makes sense. That's good, good advice. Um, yeah. On a similar note, Christina has a question. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend reaching out to the customer after a negative review or just responding and inviting them to reach out to discuss online? I would do both. I would try and call them first, get them on the phone, preferably someone of authority within the organization, owner, production manager, head doctor, I don't know, whatever, whatever business it is, and attempt to get the situation rectified. How do we screw up? What can we do to fix it, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and then respond to it online as well. Now, if you can get this whole situation taken care of, simply ask them to remove the negative review. You know, you get nothing in life without asking it, and the worst someone can tell you is no. So I would just simply ask. All right. And two more questions because I know we're running up on the hour. Yeah, you're good. I wanted to ask you, Nick. Um, Nathan wants to know where can he find the Q and A section on his uh, Google My Business dashboard. I'd have to share my screen with you, and I can't right now. Um, but it's it's. I believe it is on the. Um, it's definitely in the app. That's the best I can give you right now. It, it's a little a little hard to describe. Uh, it's there though. It just just poke around, you'll find it. Okay, and then last question. Um, Jim has on the Q and A area of Google My Business is the identity of the person asking the question listed. Yes. All right. Nice and simple. Um. All right. And any other questions that do come in or if you're watching this recording you can always reach out to our team at marketing at surefirelocal.com which um you should now see on your screen um and then as we say goodbye for today i wanted to again thank you nick for hosting today's chat and then a huge thank you to all of you as well for taking this time out of your day to spend it with us I do hope to see you back on future webinars. And like I mentioned, please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, we're here to help. And that's a wrap. So until next time, goodbye, everybody. Thanks, everyone.